Hello, and thank you for checking out this message from Grace Church San Diego. If you've never been a slave, you might assume you were free, but the truth is that we are often in bondage to the many choices we make. God has a clear answer to this dilemma. You can truly be free and embrace your best life. The series Rescued will help you to understand step by step how you can secure true freedom. We'd love to hear how Grace Church is affecting your life. Please send an email to info at gracesd.com with your story. Or if you'd like to help support our ministry financially, you can visit the website below so we can continue to help people find Christ and become His mature followers. So I was 21 years old, got my first job as a lifeguard. It wasn't my first job, but it was the first job as a lifeguard. And I was really excited. It was really fun. So I went to this camp called Victory, uh, Camp Victory or Victory Camp or whatever it was in Hemet, California. How many of you have been to Hemet? How many after having gone to Hemet go back? <laughs> Nobody does. It's just not, it's not a good move. Especially in San Diego, you go over there and go, what is this? Anyway, so I was the pool lifeguard and I said, all right, hey, what time are the pool sessions? And they said, the guys are at this time, the girls at this time. I said, why are the guys at this time? He goes, well, we don't believe, it's a Christian camp, we don't believe in mixed bathing. I said, mixed bathing? What are they doing in there? I was like, what? Mixed bathing? That's the way they used to say it back in the theaters. And so they said, we, have, we separate the girls from the guys. Anyway, so I had uh, many times these these uh, guys would fake like they're drowning, you know, because I was just a few years older than the high school kids, and the girls did the same thing. And one day I was sitting on my perch, getting a beautiful tan, not wanting to get wet, you know how lifeguards are. And I saw this girl who had previously many times faked drowning, and she was lying face down on top of the water, and I'm going, oh, yeah. Like, I'm going to jump in after that. And she's just floating there. And I'm thinking, man, she's really holding her breath a long time. And you got a decision. Do I get wet? Make a fool out of myself? And finally, I said, well, I don't know if she's faking. I got to, I got to go in anyway. And I noticed that nobody noticed her. She was lying there. Nobody noticed her. Nobody said anything. They're just swimming by and playing and stuff. And I went out there. I turned her over, and she was unconscious. And I thought, wow, everybody's just been swimming by. And I pulled her to the side of the pool, and I had some girls help me get her to the side of the pool, and she wasn't breathing, and put her on the side of the pool and started to minister CPR, something you're trained for, but you don't think you're ever going to use it. I'm trying to think, how do we do this again? And she started to breathe, and when she did, she started choking up water and so forth, and and uh, she had been rescued. She would have died if somebody didn't get her. And what was amazing to me is that nobody seemed concerned about her at all. And I think that's the truth about people who are stuck is sometimes people think, well, they're okay. Everything's fine. There's not a problem. And we don't rescue people because we think it's none of my business or for whatever reason they're fine. But in reality, they're not. And so I want to expose uh, this really important concept of how God has rescued us. Over the next five weeks, I'm going to give you principles which you can apply to your life if you are stuck, how to extricate yourself from a lifestyle that may be unhealthy for you. But also we will share with you how you can help someone else become unstuck. Welcome to Grace Church. Glad to have you with us. Are you glad to be here on Easter? Yeah. Easter, what's the big deal? What's the big deal about Easter? Oh, I remember the only religious leader to die and be raised from the dead and to live forever. Amen? Come on. Yeah. Woo! So you're sitting there in your chosen chair because they're so comfortable, aren't they? It's like, I'll keep it brief. But, you know, if you could just do us a favor and if there's an open seat, just move in. Uh, we put some extra chairs up. 
Uh, so if you could just move in, be, be that kind of person, and just move over and squeeze in, and we'll put some other people in there. Uh, welcome to those of you online campus. Glad to have you with us. How about in the house? We tell them how glad we are. Let's give them a hand, would you? Yeah. Yeah. And to our overflow room, I understand it's packed over there. They've got all kinds of food to eat over there. They're like eating food, and you thought it would be better in here. It's much better because they have a TV. They can actually turn it off. So you, you have to fall asleep. Anyway, we welcome you to Grace Church. It's good to be here on this Easter Sunday, 2016. What a, a wonderful day. You may need a Bible this morning. If you don't have one, raise your hand, and our ushers will come by with a Bible you can use uh, during the service here. And turn, if you would, to John chapter 8, one of my favorite uh, passages about these words from Jesus that bring incredible, incredible hope. Let me just tell you while they're handing those Bibles out, you are safe here. You are safe here. We're not going to condemn you. We're not going to beat you up. We're not going to make you feel badly. What we're going to do is encourage you to grow at the speed at which you want to grow. We want to encourage you to have the best life that God has and wants for you. So you are safe. It's a good place to be in Grace Church, San Diego. The unsuspecting slave. Have you ever met someone who's in bondage to something and they say, no, I'm not. Somebody who's uh, maybe uh, committed to a substance that's destroying their life, but they say, no, I'm okay. But in reality, they're stuck. You may know people like that. Not everybody knows when they are enslaved. I read a story not too long ago about a young lady named Brenda. She was, when her story began, or at least she began the story for us, she was in sixth grade. And she, throughout her elementary school years and actually preschool, she started dancing, loved dancing. And she had a teacher that had been with her for several years. And she had applied in her sixth grade year to go to a dance summer camp. And it was an elite group and not everybody got in, but she got in and she was super excited. She was so excited. She told her teacher, she said, guess what? I've been uh, uh, accepted into this summer camp, this dance camp. And of course the teacher knew all about it. And she said, well, that's great, but I need to warn you. A girl with your body type, is going to struggle. You're overweight, and you need to know that it's really going to be a problem. You're going to have to work harder because your body is not the body of a dancer. And I think probably the teacher was well-meaning, but those words were words of death to little Brenda. And in her little impressionable heart, she said, there's something wrong with me. And those words changed her life. And she spent the next several years in bondage to a lie. She believed and wanted to be perfect. She believed that the only way to be loved is to be thin. And so she started down a journey of an eating disorder. And this eating disorder began to destroy her life. She lost herself in it. And what seemed like a good decision at the time became a matter of bondage to her. At some point, she wanted to extricate herself from this eating disorder. She thought, when I stop dancing, I won't have to worry about it anymore. But of course, as she got into her adult years, she still had this lie that was her truth. And her truth was, if I'm thin, I will be loved. This was a destructive word from a unwise but well-meaning teacher. There are simple things that destroy our lives. Jesus said this, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Living a lie is a horrible way to live. It puts us in bondage. And he said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But you need to understand who he's talking to. He's talking to religious people. Are you a religious person? I can promise you, if you're a religious person, you are not gonna like Grace Church. (laughs) Just look around. I mean, we're dressed up today. We are on our best. (laughs) I usually wear shorts with a little skinny. Nah, nah, never mind. So there's this this idea that uh, through religion, I will become 
a better person. And, and in some ways that's true, but it's a lie that religion will set you free. Actually, religion will put you in bondage. And Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. So if you were to be this unsuspecting slave, you consider yourself free. If this was the chart of your life, you go, here's slavery in this circle is being enslaved or outside the circle is freedom. Where would you put yourself? You'd say, this is where I am. I'm right here. I'm free. And are you being honest with yourself? Have you believed lies that are putting you in bondage? We, most of us, don't understand when we're stuck. The more we get stuck, the more it seems normal. And we think we're okay. And usually it takes devastating things in our life, like people telling us, hey, your lifestyle is not okay for us to really deal with the fact that we're stuck. Jesus said, he answered, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham. We're Jews, we're religious people, we're God's chosen people. You need to understand that. From the Old Testament, the Jews were the chosen, they're the best of the best. And they said, we're of Abraham's seed and have never been enslaved to anyone. Well, there's a little problem with that. You remember the Babylonian captivity? You remember the, I mean, let's forget all that stuff, you know? Syrian So they had all of these captivity, but we've never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? We don't need to be free. We're, we're already free. We're Jews. By the way, at the time that they said this, Israel was occupied by Rome. They were enslaved to Rome. So they really were delusional. And that's what religious people typically do. They become delusional. Welcome to church, <laughs> where you can become delusional. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone, now listen to this, who practices sin is a slave to sin. You see, most of us go, what do I care about sin? It's no big deal. God died for my sins. It's okay. I can do whatever I want. Well, here's the problem, that when you sin, that sin begins to dominate your life. And when you practice sin, Jesus said you become a slave to sin. Maybe you don't even know it. Maybe that sin seemed to you to be the right thing to do at the time, or you wanted to do it because you believed it would make you feel alive. Now, I'm not suggesting by sharing this story about Brenda that she made a moral decision. She didn't make a moral decision. She made a mistake based on a lie that if she was perfect, she would be accepted. So I know this was a psychological thing that she entered into, and she was looking for her best life or to have a good life. However, in, the case, in either case, she was a slave to this lie. What lies do you believe? What is enslaving you? What is keeping you from having your best life? What is holding you back? Do you know how to extricate yourself from these lies? So we identify ourselves outside of here, but Jesus has clearly said, if you practice sin, you are not out here, but you are literally in here. This is where you are. Now, every one of us practices sin, except me, I'm a pastor. <laughs> so I don't sin. My wife's here. Let me, let me change that just a little bit. So I only sin when my wife is wrong. Whatever. But we become a slave to our own behavior. It becomes a burden to us. And Jesus makes it clear that everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the more we sin, the more in bondage we are. So what's the answer to all this? He wants us to be set free. He actually can set each one of us free. And I want you to understand how important this is. You know, um, when the, just before the birth of Jesus, a couple hundred years before the birth of Jesus, or a few hundred years before, Alexander the Great conquered the known world. And now he had conquered all these nations. And when he conquered all these nations, he had people that spoke this language, this language, and they had armies from every one of these nations. And now they were under his control. 
And he thought, how am I going to get them to communicate with each other? So he established, he got these scholars together, and they established what is called Koine Greek, Common Greek. It was a secondary language that everybody spoke, or at least most people spoke. That was a simple language in which it could be clear commands from a, uh, a commander of his armies and say, this is what we want to do, and they would know exactly how that would be done. Now understand that Israel, once again, I, I mentioned that they are controlling, uh, Rome is controlling Israel. It's an occupied territory. And they are enslaved to, to Rome. So these, this Koine Greek, this common language, has very specific words about slavery. And these, I want to share with you three words that actually the, the New Testament was written in this ancient Koine Greek. And there are three words that are really interesting about slaves. Now, understand what they would do is people were slave owners and they would take their slaves and they wanted to sell their slaves to another slave owner. So they'd bring them to the marketplace. And when they'd bring them to the marketplace, they'd set a price and then they would auction off these slaves. And when they auction off these slaves, they'd get the best price they could. The, the new potential buyers would go and check out these slaves. And what they did is they would actually have them open their mouth to see if they had rotted teeth or if they were healthy. And they would check out their muscle structure. In some cases, even these potential owners would ask the owner of that slave, I want to beat this slave to see how much he can endure. Literally would beat the slave to see if this is the kind of slave I want. And then they would go up onto the, in the marketplace and they'd put him up on the stand and then they would auction off that slave. And so there was, in Koine Greek, there was a, a three words that talked about how these slaves were auctioned off. The first one is a, the Greek word agorazo. The Greek word agorazo means to pay the price in the marketplace. In other words, you pay whatever you can get that slave for, and that's the purchase price. That's what agorazo means. It's used in Revelation uh, chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seal, for you were slain, speaking about Jesus, and by your blood, speaking to Jesus, by your own blood, Jesus, you ransomed the people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The word ransom is the word agarazo. You, by your blood, paid the price for our sins. And you have liberated people from all over the world. Agarazo. So he paid the price. The problem is, even though that price is paid, that slave is still a slave, but just has a new owner. The second word is ekagarazo. It's the same word, but this time it has a little preposition in front, and it means out of. And it literally means to remove or take out of after purchasing, the purchase price is paid, to take them out of the marketplace. This is used in Galatians 3.13. It says this. Uh, it says, Christ redeemed ek agarazo, purchased and took us out of the marketplace from the curse of the law by becoming curse for to us it was written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so Jesus paid the price, and not only paid the price in the marketplace, but then he took us out of the marketplace, and now we're out of the marketplace, but we're still slaves. Then there's a third word. It's the word latruo, and it means to set free. It means to loosen a slave. And the word latruo is used in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9 and verse 12, it says, He entered once for all into the holy place. This is Jesus entered into the holy of holies. Once for all, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing, listen to this, an eternal redemption. And the word redemption is eternal latruo. We have been set free. We are no longer slaves. We have been released. And every single person that heard these words, would, would, their mind would go to the marketplace where slaves were sold and they would say, oh, he paid the price with his blood. Oh, he took us out of the marketplace by his blood and we are no longer under the law. But oh, wait a minute, he has ransomed us. He has redeemed us, Latruo. He set us free. You can be free in Jesus Christ. And everyone who heard that knew what he was talking about. 
Though the price is paid, you might still be in bondage. Though uh, the price has been paid, you've been taken out of the marketplace and you're no, no, no longer under the law. But Christ has prepared an eternal freedom. We are no longer slaves, but we are set free. There's a guy that goes to our church that uh, I met uh, several months ago. And, you know, when the first time I met him, you know, he, thankfully he smiled because he kind of scares me a little bit. Uh, you ever meet one of those guys who go, man, if I met him in a dark alley, I'd be scared to death. But this guy comes up with a smile. I'm like, okay, that's cool. He comes up and gives me a hug. He tells me how awesome the message was. I was like, okay, we're good. Maybe he could be my bodyguard or something. His name is Brian. He's a friend of mine. I, I just love his testimony. And he did, he did for us a uh, video. And I just want you to take just a moment and listen to this video, watch this video, and see Brian's story. Watch this. So my life from about the age of 20, I would say till I was about 35, 36, my life was um, dedicated to methamphetamine. But pretty soon I realized that my habit was so big that uh, the only way I was going to afford to use uh, was to uh, sell it you know, and, and just have it around me all the time. I mean, there was times where I would look at myself in the mirror and just stare at myself and go, you're completely done. You're hopeless. There is no way that you're not going to use this drug until the day you die. I was drinking a lot, and uh, uh, some of the people that I was associated with when I was selling drugs decided they still wanted to come around. And... Um, I told him not to, and uh, one, one, uh, one evening I was um, drinking, and I had some guns in the house, and uh, this guy came over to my house who I knew, and, um, you know, uh, I just decided, I snapped. I, you know, he, he came over, and I had already told him, don't come over, and anyways, he came over, so I ended up um, putting a shotgun in his face, and... Um, um, you know, he started running, and I chased him out and started firing some rounds off up in the air. And needless to say, I went to jail. And um, <clears throat> the charges that I was looking at were um, pretty extensive, and I was looking at doing probably about 15 years. When I was locked up, there was a change that happened to me, and it took me... On looking back now, it took for me to go to that complete hopelessness, the, the complete despair, in order to see it, you know. I asked God for help when I was in jail. When I was laying there on my cot, staring at the cot above me, I just asked God for help. You know, I didn't know what he was. I didn't know how to approach it. I didn't know what to say. I just said, God, if you're there... You know, I need help. Just the goodness that I feel in my heart, you know, is just such an opposite of how I used to be. You know, I used to take advantage of people. Now all I want to do is help people, you know. But for me, I try to look at it as um, whatever God's next indicated step is. And that's what I'm going to do. If I could go from being a completely hopeless, messed up individual and being restored by grace to do kingdom work for God. I mean, come on, man. I don't, you can't pay for that. Yeah. He always, he always sits right up front and I used to be afraid if I go too long, what's gonna happen? You know what I'm saying? But not only is God sent his son into Brian's heart and transformed him. He's given new love in his life, and his life is completely turned around. Thank God for a brother who loves God and let the tenderness of God just shine through him. This is what I'm talking about when you get rescued. In the depths of despair, Brian was rescued by the very grace of God. Jesus, in John 8, 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever, the sun remains forever. So what does that mean? 
you know, think back, you're first century. You know about Roman slavery and you've observed it. Maybe you're a slave owner and you know something. You know something about who gets access to the house of the master. Guess who doesn't have access? Slaves, other than to serve there, but they had to leave. But do, who does have access? The son of the master. He can come and go, and he has any access to the house. I grew up in a, in a home where there were six kids, and we had full access to the house, except during the day. My mom said, go outside when the lights come on, then you, or go on at night, then you can come back in. We were slaves during the daytime. <laughs> but we had a little neighbor named Billy Champlin. Billy Champlin used to come down to our house on this great little a cul-de-sac that we lived, and we had all these kids, and Billy Champlin would just walk right into our house. He not only would walk right into it, he'd go up to the refrigerator and start, you know, looking through the refrigerator to see what, you know, get some food and get our candy and stuff. I'm like, what is going on here? Hey, dude, you, you got to get out of here. He goes, no, we're friends. We're friends when you're outside, bro. This is my house. That's my dad. You go eat your dad's food. You know, sons have access to the house. Jesus Christ gained through his resurrection access as this God-man, God and man in one being. He gained access to the throne room of God and he sits at the right hand of the Father and he forever remains in the house and what he's telling these people is it's not through religion, it's not through Judaism, it's not because you're Abraham's seed, either the Son sets you free or you will not be free indeed. The only way, he said, if the truth sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Then he says, if the Son therefore sets you free, you'll be free indeed. What is it? The Son is the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You see, Jesus is the truth. And so the truth setting you free is actually Jesus setting you free through his death, burial, and resurrection. There is, under the slavery concept, a, a New Testament word. It was used in the Greek culture of that first century, and the Romans used it too. They were called free men. For women and men that had been freed from slavery, this word was used, and it's used in scripture. There were three kinds of liberations. One was a fugitive slave, but they were never really free. They ran from their, their owner. The second one is a freedman that the owner actually released the obligation, legally released them uh, from the bondage of their slavery. And the other one is uh, emancipation. Now, emancipation is actually a corporate thing or a, a governmental thing. It's, we had the Emancipation Proclamation, and it was about time that we realized that all human beings are equal and that they have rights and should have these rights under the law, and that's what we did. And we're still struggling with that a little bit, but we're, we're getting on the other side of it. But that's a political thing. But the only thing that is real is when the owner releases you and you are truly, truly free. And God, our creator, has released us through the Son of God from the bondage of the law and the bondage of sin. And you can be totally free in Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says, Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. He didn't free us so that we would go back into bondage. He said this. Stand firm, therefore, in your freedom, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Do not submit. Some of these slaves would go back to their master once they'd been freedmen, and they would go back because they were afraid to live out this response because their identity was wrong. Listen, some of us know Jesus Christ, but we act as though we don't, and it's because we don't understand our identity in Christ, that we are free. We have freedom to serve the Lord Jesus. When you come to Jesus Christ as Savior, you have the freedom to live a life. And God has designed a plan for your freedom. And it's as simple as, as this. Number one, out of love, God sent his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall never perish 
but have everlasting life. But the design goes on. Jesus died and was buried. And you think at that point, the disciples are like, okay, three days he's going to be raised. He told us he's going to be, he told us where he'd be killed. He told us how he'd be killed. So certainly his resurrection is a sure deal. None of them believed. None of them. The proof of that is, Pastor Scott Laughlin said last week, the, we know the disciples didn't believe because they would have been going, you know, on Easter Sunday morning, they would have gone 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Nobody was, they were cowered up in the room waiting and they don't know what to do. And they were shocked when Jesus was raised from the dead just as he said he would be. And then after he was raised from the dead, everything was changed. And that's the third part of it. On the third day, he was raised to life. And finally, God gives to us eternal life as a free gift. Listen to this, Romans 6, 23. For the wage of sin is death. That's the cost of sin. I don't know about you, but I know I'm a sinner. And all you have to do is hang out with me for a while and you'll know it too. But everyone in this room is a sinner. Every one of you are. And maybe it's just a minor offense. Maybe you're not as bad as I am but you are definitely a sinner. And one failure excludes you from heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But listen to this. That's death is the cost of sin, he said in Romans 6, 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. All you have to do is receive it. Have you received Jesus Christ? Has he become your savior? Have you been set free? Are you still in bondage? You can be free today. You can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. Would you just bow your head?